As many of you know, my family and I were in the holy lands of Israel, Jordan, and Egypt these past few weeks. A few brave church members joined this very low-key, last-minute, exploratory Bible study tour to see how it would be like to travel with the group during a COVID pandemic. Our family flew to Israel a few days ahead of the larger group because I had some meetings and ministry commitments. After a few meals of Middle Eastern food, my family was craving Asian food, specifically Chinese food. I found a Chinese restaurant aptly named Mandarin in Jerusalem near a hotel, and we walked there for a lunch. We were very hungry and ready to have our cravings satisfied. Our family of five arrived just a few minutes ahead of two larger groups that came in after us. But since they had pre-ordered their food, they were served first. The restaurant was a bit understaffed, so the owner, the Lao Pan, was also busy serving the food with her help staff. She was unable to take our order because of how busy she was. She came by to apologize once and ask for our patience. We were also thirsty after a long walk, but she nor her busy staff was able to get us water. We tried to be understanding and patient, but we were hungry and thirsty. After about an hour, when the group finally left, she came to our table, gave us some water, and took our food order. Another 30 minutes later, our food came out, and we devoured the food. Because the restaurant was basically empty at this point, the owner talked to us. She asked us what we were doing in Jerusalem, and Cindy told her in Mandarin Chinese that I'm a pastor and that I would lead groups to visit the Holy Lands. She said, I knew it. I knew you had to be Christians because you were all so patient and understanding. Other customers would have gotten angry and even yell at me. Thank you for being so nice and kind. If only she knew the conversation our family had during our one hour of waiting, she would have thought otherwise. We were upset, impatient, had talked about leaving the restaurant, but our craving for Chinese food, just simple white rice and some soy-based food, was the reason we stayed and didn't cause a commotion even though we technically arrived before the groups by a few minutes. But when she said thanks for being so kind as Christians, we just said, you're welcome, and accepted it. Well, after the group from the Philippines flew in a few days later, and we started our Bible study tour, after countless Middle Eastern meals, they too were craving Asian food. So the group decided to skip the prearranged dinner and have a Chinese dinner in Jerusalem. It was a Monday, and Cindy called the restaurant, and after a few rings, got the owner on the phone. She asked to make a reservation that evening for dinner. But the owner told Cindy that the restaurant was closed on Mondays as a rest day. But when she asked Cindy who she was, Cindy told her we were that pastor's family that came in a week and a half earlier to eat. Her tone changed, and she said, Oh, you were that kind family. Well, let me make a special exemption and let me open my restaurant just for you and your group, and I will personally cook for you all. She said the lights of the restaurant would be turned off or else others may think they were open, but you just come on in and your dinner will be prepared. And she indeed prepared an amazing authentic Chinese meal with her own hands, which we all enjoyed. As I think about this incident, I'm reminded that oftentimes, our lives are in the hands of others. The owner of this restaurant chose whom to serve and whom to serve first. She chose if she wanted to open the restaurant or not, and she chose if she wanted to cook herself or not. It was all in her hands. In our lives, we have many options of whose hands we will put our lives in, our own, others, or that of God's mighty hands. Sadly and unfortunately, we would rather entrust our lives often in the hands of others, even our own, before entrusting our lives into God's hands. But my friends, I want to encourage you to consider putting your lives totally in the mighty, protective hands of our Lord. And I want to do so by looking at a familiar passage in the Bible. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 6, as we study verses 1 to 14. John chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, as we continue our series titled Marvel. In this series, we are looking at the seven miracles of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of John and seeing how God uniquely displays His omnipotent power and how we are to respond to God's power. I read now verses 1 to 4. 
After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. In these verses, we're told that Jesus and his disciples went into a boat on the Sea of Galilee to get some alone time on one of the sloping mountains that surrounded this lake to rest and rejuvenate. The corresponding account of the same incident in Mark chapter 6 tells us that Jesus and his disciples were so busy ministering to many people that they didn't even have time to eat. But look at what happens. Apparently, the people followed Jesus by land around the northern shores of this very large lake. And by the time Jesus arrived by boat with his disciples, they were already there, ready to meet him. Luke chapter 9, verse 10 tells us that the place they sailed to was called Bethsaida Julius, a remote town in the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. Their planned, deserved time of rest was interrupted by people with real and present needs. What would you do if you were in Jesus' position or in a similar situation? You deserved the break, but people with real problems needed your help. Would you care for these people? The corresponding gospel accounts in Matthew 14, Mark 6, and Luke 9 tell us that Jesus was so moved with compassion that he began to minister to them and to heal them. Perhaps Jesus was thinking about the effort these people made to follow him. And even if it ruined his planned rest time with his disciples, Jesus was not annoyed, but instead filled with compassion for the people. You know, I live in the parsonage of this church, and sometimes our doorbell would ring with someone looking for me. Admittedly, I would sometimes be frustrated because it would be late at night. I have thought to myself, why don't these people with problems have problems during my office hours? But then I would catch myself and realize that people's problems don't come with a specific time frame. You don't plan for when your loved ones will die. You don't plan for when you will have an emotional breakdown. You don't plan for when you will have a major fight with your spouse. You don't plan for when you're at the end of your ropes and need to talk to someone. So I need to quickly remind myself that when people come to you with a real problem and we want to serve them and show compassion, it is on their time frame, not on your timetable. As our compassionate Lord ministered to the multitude of people who had followed him and gathered near Bethsaida, it was getting late in the day, and we find out in the other gospel accounts that Jesus' disciples tried to send the people away because they realized they would not be able to feed so many people in such a remote place. I read now verse 5. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? I want you to note something. Nowhere in the four gospel accounts of this same incident does it indicate that the people who gathered had asked for food. They were there to be ministered to by Jesus, not for physical food. However, Jesus knew it had been a long day for them. They had probably run alongside the northern shores of this large lake as they tried to follow the boat of Jesus, and perhaps they didn't have time to prepare a meal or take snacks with them. They simply followed Jesus, so desperate they were to be with him. Jesus knew they would be hungry, and it would be impossible to find enough food for such a large crowd that had gathered in such a remote place. It is in this situational context that Jesus asked one of his disciples, Philip, this question. Where are we going to buy the bread that will feed all of these people? You see, Jesus saw it as his responsibility and ultimately his own disciples' responsibility to care even for the people's unspoken physical needs. In the other gospel accounts, Jesus had instructed his disciples, you give them something to eat. You see, the compassionate Savior not only cares for our spoken needs, but also our unspoken, unrequested needs. He cares for both our spiritual and physical needs. And this is our first biblical principle I want us to understand. Biblical principle number one. The compassionate Savior cares for all of our needs, both spoken 
and unrequested. The compassionate Savior cares for all of our needs, both spoken and unrequested. This means that the Lord looks at the totality of our needs and meets them in accordance with His will. You see, oftentimes, we only ask for things we think we need, but God also meets the needs of things we don't think we need or didn't think to ask for. Remember what Romans chapter 8, verse 26 reminds us. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Similarly, in Matthew chapter 6, we're told not to worry, because if God can take care of the birds in the air and the lilies of the field, and we are of much greater value to the Lord than those things, then He will take care of all of our needs, whether spoken or unspoken, whether spiritual or physical. My friends, this principle is important to understand because oftentimes we may feel that God has abandoned us because of what we have to go through or that God is not with us because He gives us things we didn't ask for or doesn't give us things we do ask for. But when we understand how the compassionate, all-powerful God operates, we can accept it as being what is best for us in order to meet our real needs instead of our perceived needs. For example, during our Holy Lands trip, as parents, we have to constantly remind our three children over and over again at every site, bring your hats, put on sunscreen, and drink plenty of water. Of course, this was to protect them from the heat and the sun. But do you think they want to bring their hats and water every time they step off the bus and go to a site or put on sunscreen? Of course not. They think they are young and invincible. Do you think they want to be constantly reminded to the point of nagging to do these things? Of course not. But because we love them as parents, we know they need to do these things, and it is for their good to prevent sunburns and dehydration. Even though they didn't ask for hats, water, and sunscreen, we provided it for them because they needed it. Likewise, when we understand our Lord cares for all of our needs, both spoken and unrequested, then we will humbly accept what He gives us and brings into our lives, and we can also rest assured knowing that He is looking out for our best. I read now verses 6 and 7. But this He said to test Him, for He Himself knew what He would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. Verse 6 tells us that Jesus was trying to test how strong his disciples' faith in his powers were when he asked Philip where he would get the bread to feed the multitudes that had gathered. Jesus was giving Philip the chance to declare his faith in the all-powerful divine Son of God who could miraculously feed the thousands gathered. Remember, these disciples had seen Jesus heal countless sick people up close and at a distance. They had witnessed Him turn water into wine. Could this all-powerful God not also feed the multitudes? Apparently, Philip didn't think Jesus could feed them because he says in verse 7 that even 200 denarii would not be enough to feed all of these people to a satisfactory level. You see, Philip had done the math in his head and it didn't add up. He only looked through the lenses of human means, not by faith in the all-powerful God. The denarius was the basic Roman silver coin used in Palestine, which was the average daily wage of a farm laborer. So 200 denarii was roughly equivalent to eight months of a man's wages. And this large sum of money, which the disciples also didn't have, would still not be sufficient to feed all of the people to a satisfactory fullness. You see, there was the problem of where to get the money. There was the problem of where to buy the bread. And there was the problem of how satisfied the people would be. That's why the disciples' initial solution was to send a large crowd away for them to find their own food. Now look at me at verses 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? In the corresponding gospel account in Mark chapter 6, 
we're told that Jesus sends out his disciples to see how much food is out there among the people. No doubt the implied instruction from Jesus to his disciples is to go see how much food is out there that the people are willing to share. The disciple Andrew found a young boy that had five loaves of barley bread and two small fish. Of course, they had to tell the boy that Jesus was looking for food to share with everyone there. I often wondered what kind of boy he was, a boy that would be so willing to share his food with others. I mean, how many little hungry boys do you know willingly share their food? I certainly wasn't inclined to share food when I was young and even when I'm older. But it wasn't as if Andrew dragged the boy kicking and screaming and forced him to share his bread and fish with Jesus. Also, if the boy was told he would share his food with all the people gathered, wouldn't he have naturally said, that's impossible. My little food is not enough to feed everyone so I'm just going to keep it to myself. If his parents were with him, they surely would have said the same thing. But I believe because this boy was willing to come with Andrew to Jesus, that this child's faith was such that he saw that the Jesus who could do miraculous things could somehow and in some way use his little food to feed the thousands. That's why he was so willing to give up his food to share with others and come along with Andrew. Notice at the end of verse 9, Andrew's realistic and pragmatic concern was how can such a small quantity of food be able to feed the thousands who were there? It was an attitude that would have stood in stark contrast to the faith of that young boy. And from these verses, we can draw out our second biblical principle, biblical principle number two. Pragmatism often prevents us from seeing faith-based solutions. Pragmatism often prevents us from seeing faith-based solutions. My friends, part of us believing in an all-powerful God who can do miracles and do the impossible is that it gives us hope. It causes us to look beyond the despair of this world and the disappointments of our present situation to see the possibilities that come with faith in an almighty God. Now let me just caution us and say that faith-based solutions does not mean We don't have to do any planning or do not have any responsibilities of our own to uphold. The Bible tells us very clearly to count the costs, to wisely plan ahead, to put in the hard work to fulfill our God-given responsibilities. But this principle is to remind us that as believers in an all-powerful God, we can have hope in any situation we are put in. You know, traveling abroad this summer has been a challenge, especially if your flights take you to North America. Europe, and the Middle East. As staff shortages, record number of travelers, and limited flights have caused massive flight delays and cancellations, left luggages at airports numbering in the tens of thousands, and countless hours waiting at the airports, staying in line to get through security. All of this has been reported in the news. Just Google Heathrow, Skiffle, or Tel Aviv. I had to fly through some of these problematic airports with my family on this trip, and I was worried. We prepared for the worst and even packed a few days of clothes in our hand carries just in case our checked-in luggage would be lost or be delayed. Why would our luggage be an exception to the tens of thousands that didn't make their flights? The probability of all five of our luggage making it through was highly unlikely in the current situation. So we even planned to distribute our clothes so that each bag held a set of everyone's clothes. We were playing the probability game. But we prayed before every flight as a family and before every transit connection that the Lord would see to it that all would be well. And you know what? Not a single luggage was lost or left behind on every flight segment that we took. All five checked-in luggage arrived at all the airports we flew in and out of. Even though we saw in some cases hundreds and thousands of luggage simply left at the baggage claim in what can only be described as luggage graveyards. In fact, we arrived four hours ahead of our flights knowing that the security lines took that long to get through, only to find out that when we got there, the lines had thinned out for that time period we arrived and we got through in only 15 to 30 minutes. In fact, most all of the countries we visited had COVID surges and considered COVID as a part of life and few to none wore masks. 
in the back of my mind, surely someone in our family would get COVID from this trip, even if we took precautions. And yet again, by God's grace and protection, we all came back not having contracted COVID. How did we, quote-unquote, beat the odds as it related to luggage, COVID, lines, and flights? It wasn't luck. It was because we entrusted our trip into the hands of an almighty God who was ensuring that all would be well. And all we did was spend a few minutes in prayer before we left at the airport at every flight segment. My friends, the pragmatic realities were such that we should prepare that something would go wrong. But the faith-based solution was all would be okay because Almighty God was in control. You don't only, quote-unquote, beat the odds when you entrust your lives in God's hands. He controls the odds because He is sovereign and in control of the entire universe. Don't let pragmatism get in the way of you seeing what can be accomplished with God on your side, helping you overcome whatever challenges are out there. Not enough money? No problem for God. Not enough food? No problem for God. As long as there is someone with a little heart of faith like that young boy, God can show everyone what he can do with something little, a little bread and some fish. I read now verse 10. Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the man sat down in number about 5,000. Perhaps in order to ensure orderly distribution, Jesus commanded his disciples to have everyone sit down in groups on the green grass. In Mark's account, we're told they were grouped in groups of 50 and hundreds. Verse 11, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. The Bible tells us that after Jesus gave thanks to God, he broke the bread and divided the fish and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. Now, the question you should ask is, where did the miracle of the multiplication take place? In the hands of Jesus or in the hands of the disciples? If you read verse 11 carefully, we see that the miracle of multiplication happened in the hands of Jesus. The disciples would get the share of bread and fish for the groups from the Lord. The Bible tells us each of the groups were allowed to request as much fish and bread as they wanted. So most likely the disciples had to make multiple trips to Jesus to get more bread and fish for that group. So let's do a little calculation here. It says there was a count of 5,000 men, which did not include women and children, as Matthew 14, 21 tells us. A conservative estimate of 10,000 people present would be reasonable. And let's say these 10,000 were grouped into hundreds that would yield 100 groups. And 100 groups divided by 12, 12 disciples, is 8.5 groups of 100 people for each disciple to handle. Now, if you're making a trip to bring food from Jesus to these people, how much food can you carry? Let me suggest that one disciple can carry 10 people's worth of food on one trip from Jesus to the group they're assigned to. That's 85 trips per disciple at a minimum to come to Jesus for food and bring it to the group they're responsible for. And since the Bible tells us these people could have as much food as they wanted, I'm sure some would have wanted seconds. So let's conservatively add 15 more trips to each disciple. So you have 100 trips per disciple from Jesus to the group they're assigned to carrying armloads of food to feed 10 people per trip. Putting it all together conservatively, that's 1,200 armloads full of food that the 12 disciples brought from Jesus to the people who were there. And it all began with only five loaves of bread and two fish. What a miracle of multiplication to show forth the power of God in the second person of the triune Godhead. There was a lesson for Philip, Andrew, and the other disciples there. They were to keep coming back to the Lord for provisions to provide for the people they were assigned to care for. And from this, we draw out our third biblical principle, biblical principle number three. Everything is possible and abundant in the hands of the Lord. Everything is possible and abundant in the hands of our Lord. 
in the hands of Christ, the abundance never ends. So imagine if we put our lives in His hands. Think of how our lives will be abundant and multiplied, whether it is in the matter of wisdom, your purpose and significance in this life, your blessings, your ability to do great things for Him. Everything is possible and abundant in the hands of the Lord. That's why in Matthew chapter 28, the Lord declares that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And in John chapter 15, verse 5, the Lord says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. My friends, a running theme throughout the Bible is in the Lord there is abundance, and in Christ we can do anything and everything in accordance with his will. Remember what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the reason is because it is in the hands of the living God, the Lord God, who can do all things, who is all-powerful. All things are possible and abundant in His hands. Look at me now at verses 12 to 14. So when they were filled, He said to His disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. The Bible tells us that when the thousands had had their fill of bread and fish, Jesus commanded his disciples to gather the leftover food so that there would be no wastage. The leftovers were able to fill 12 baskets, presumably to show each of the 12 disciples the abundance that came when one entrusts what they have to Jesus. Remember earlier, Philip had estimated that eight months' wages would not be sufficient to buy enough food to feed more than 10,000 people who were there. Even Andrew acknowledged that five loaves of bread and two fish was not enough. But after this miracle, they must have learned that everything is possible and abundant in the hands of the Lord. One of my favorite true stories is this. In 1975, a child named Raymond Dunn Jr. was born in New York State. The Associated Press reported that at his birth, a skull fracture and oxygen deprivation caused severe mental disabilities. As Raymond grew, the family discovered further impairments. His twisted body suffered up to 20 seizures per day. He was blind, mute, and immobile. He had severe allergies that limited him to only one food, a meat-based formula made by Gerber Foods. In 1985, Gerber Foods stopped making the formula that Raymond lived on, and his mother, Carol Dunn, scoured the country to buy what stores had in stock, accumulating cases and cases of that formula. But in 1990, her supply ran out. In desperation, she appealed to Gerber Food Corporation for help. Without this particular food, Raymond would starve to death. The employees of the company listened. In an unprecedented action, volunteers of that company donated hundreds of hours to bring out old equipment, set up production lines, obtaining special approval from the USDA, and produce the formula all for one special boy. In January 1995, Raymond Dunn Jr., known as the Gerber Boy, died from his physical problems. But during his brief lifetime, he called forth a wonderful thing called compassion and kindness. The employees of Gerber Foods moved heaven and earth just to provide for Raymond Dunn to survive. But in the same way, God literally moves heaven and earth to help us, his children, That is the promise He has made to us in the Bible. Our God looks down upon us with care and concern, and He will do everything in His power to help us as He did with the multitudes that had gathered to see Him but didn't have food. If you and I understand this truth, we will always hold fast to the one in whose hand the impossibilities are made possible and in whose hands there is the abundance of everything. It is a wonderment with this truth why we would turn to anyone or anything else other than to the God of the universe who loves us with an everlasting love. 
Now let me close with this poem titled, Whose Hands? A basketball in my hands is worth a few dollars. A basketball in Michael Jordan's hands is worth millions. It depends whose hands it's in. A tennis racket is useless in my hands. A tennis racket in Venus Williams' hands is a Wimbledon championship. It depends whose hands it's in. A rod in my hand will keep away a wild animal. A rod in Moses' hands will part the mighty sea. It depends whose hands it's in. A slingshot in my hands is a kid's toy. A slingshot in David's hands is a mighty weapon. It depends whose hands it's in. Two fish and five loaves in my hands is a couple of fish sandwiches. Two fish and five loaves of bread in God's hands will feed thousands. It depends whose hands it's in. Nails in my hands might produce a birdhouse. Nails in Jesus Christ's hands will produce salvation for the entire world. It depends whose hands it's in. As you see now, it depends whose hands it's in. So put your concerns, your worries, your fears, your hopes, your dreams, your families, and your relationships in God's hands because it depends whose hands it's in. My friends, let me encourage you to entrust your lives into the mighty, protective hands of our Lord. Do not entrust it to yourself nor the world, but place it in the hands of God because, number one, the compassionate Savior cares for all of our needs, both spoken and unrequested. Number two, pragmatism often prevents us from seeing faith-based solutions. Number three, everything is possible and abundant in the hands of the Lord. My friends, God sent His only begotten Son to die for us while we were still sinners. This is His compassionate care for our unrequested needs. The pragmatic solution would be to simply let us die in our sins because we all deserved hell because of our sinful lives. But Jesus Christ died for our sins in our place and conquered death by resurrecting, something so illogical and impossible, but yet He declared that we all receive eternal life when we place our faith and trust in His finished work on the cross. And when we place by faith our lives in His mighty hands, we place our lives under the protection and care of the one who does the impossible and provides us life abundant. So why would we not want to put our lives in the Lord's hands? Because at the end of the day, it depends whose hands it's in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. What a wonderful reminder that when we place our lives in your hands, it is a life that is abundant. It is a life that is multiplied. And through this miracle of the multiplication of the bread and the fish to feed the thousands, you show yourself as the God who is able to do the impossible. Father, help us not to be like Philip and Andrew who only saw through human eyes. We hope we will have the faith of this little boy who could see the God who does miracles can do miracles in our lives in accordance with your will. Help us to live by faith and not by sight. Encourage us in our faith walk that we will live our lives for you, securely putting our lives in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.